going to start. All right, and I will start by welcoming all of you to um, our nature program series. We're very excited to uh, you know, be starting our virtual evening programs back up. And you know, we love it when it's a rainy Thursday evening because it makes the decision <laughs> inside so much easier. Um, and we're very excited to have Will back with us. Um, it's fall, so it's all about birds. Um, before I hand things over to Will, I'm going to go through my. I think I might like the show. Um, I want I to like start it. just by um, by thanking our Nature Program series sponsors for their financial support: um, Hancock Lumber, Ragged Mountain Equipment, and White Mountain Oil and Propane. Um, you know that allow us to bring presenters in. I also want to thank our members. Those of you who are members out there, thank you so much for your support. Um, it helps us to bring in, to continue our programming. If you're not a Tin Mountain member and that's something um, you want to consider or explore on our website, tinmountain.org, um, in the upper right-hand corner, there is a support us tab. You can look at the different membership options. Um, if membership isn't right for you at this point, there's also um, a tab in there just to donate to our nature program series so that we can continue. Um, what we are doing. And speaking of continuing what we are doing, um, just a plug for a few of our upcoming programs, especially since there are a number of avian-minded folks in the audience today. Um, we have, um, this weekend, we have a um, a field sketching program, an in-person program. I actually believe we only have one remaining space for that. That's this Saturday at the Nature Learning Center. Um, it's focusing on wildflowers um, and will run 9.30 to 11. Um, and you can register for that online. Um, uh, we, but we do have coming up, so I know a number of you are already registered for it, but there is, uh, for those interested and associated, um, in-person walk, bird walk on the 18th in the Brownfield Bog to see, you know, hopefully a, a number of the species that Will will talk about tonight. Um, and that you can also register for on our website. Um, in addition to that, we have, uh, you know, the following week we have hawks. So Katie Lewis, our research manager, will um, on Thursday, the 23rd, we'll be presenting an evening, a virtual evening program on hawks. That's the Hawk Talk. And then on the 25th, we'll be doing our annual Hawk Watch. Um, this year, we'll be heading to Perry Mountain um, over in the Brownfield area. So those are a few of our upcoming programs and a little bit further out on the horizon, but one that I do want to um, start putting in a plug for is that we're very excited to um, have Scott Weisenthal uh, presenting virtually on Thursday, October 14th. So that um, that's one to mark your calendar for. Um, you know, he'll be talking primarily about his, um, his recent book, World on the Wing, um, about global migration. So lots of exciting um, things there. Just a great opportunity to see, you know, an international best-selling author, um, you know, and, and a recent uh, transplant to New Hampshire. So we, we do love that connection um, as well. So lots of, of interesting upcoming programs. Um, if, you know, since we're just getting back into the swing of Zoom life after taking a summer hiatus, just a reminder, um, we do ask that you mute yourself so that we don't pick up um, background noise from your home um, to distract others. If you have a question during the program, um, probably the easiest way to ask them is to type it directly into the chat feature at the bottom of the screen. I'll be monitoring that. Um, if it's an immediate clarifying question, I can pop in. Um, and interrupt Will and ask that of him. Otherwise, I'll wait um, till the end um, and ask those questions of him. At that time, you're also welcome to unmute yourself um, and ask questions of him directly. Otherwise, um, whew, there's my yes. Uh, otherwise, uh, you know, we are here as, you know, the Brownfield Bog is, is a spot that we, that we frequent. 
um, in the spring, but it's also a great birding location in the fall. So we're excited uh, you know, to have Will put together a presentation on fall birds of the bog, as well as that associated walk that I mentioned. And we're very excited to hit that, at least for the time being that, that Will still remains a board member of Teen Mountain. So we, we appreciate all he does, and I'm going to hand things over to him. Great, let me share my screen. All right, everyone. Thank you, Nora and Tin Mountain for having me back. It's really exciting to see all of you virtually. Once again, my name is Will Broussard. I'm a board member of Tin Mountain Conservation Center and a lifelong birder. And I'm excited to share with you some of the birds that we should be seeing when we visit the bog, the Brownfield Bog in Brownfield, Maine on September 18th, so uh, a week from Saturday. And details regarding where we'll meet and all um, will be forthcoming. Um, once you sign up and follow Tin Mountains News, you should be getting that info. So tonight's program is going to be the birds of the bog, but also a little bit about migration. So. Um, the way it's going to go is I'm going to talk about kind of the timeline of the different species that we are expecting to see through the late summer into the fall and some of the different strategies that birds employ, birds that live around here employ um, in, the, in their life cycle um, that has to do with migration because there are different kinds of migration strategies. So we'll go over that. We're going to talk about um, some target species that we hope to see at the bog, specifically a few different shorebirds that I know have been seen at Brownfield Bog, which is pretty exciting. Since it is a bog, it's not the shore, it's not the seashore, um, but it is an open body of water. So there, there is the opportunity to see some cool shorebirds. And because it's an open space, we should be getting some good looks at some raptors. So I'm not gonna try not to steal too much of Katie's thunder by talking too much about raptors. We'll go over a couple of the field marks for some of the common raptors we might see. Um, but much of the bulk of the presentation will be on the songbirds that we're gonna see at the bog. Um, Cause that's also where some of our, biggest frustrations lie in identifying the confusing fall dress of many of our uh, songbirds, including the warblers. And I'll wrap it up with some resources and questions. So I love this um, image from uh, that the Boreal Songbird Initiative uses to show the different pathways of the different uh, species of birds that use the boreal forest. I like this image because it really, it, it shows um, the, the vast pathway that many of our migratory birds are using through um, the fall season. You know, these birds that we're going to be seeing at Brownfield Bog, many of them were born further north, you know, possibly a thousand miles north in the Arctic tundra of uh, northern Quebec, Canada, maybe even further north. Um, and they're going to be coming through the bog as part of their natural fall migration on their way south. Um, you know, birds are migrating to follow essentially the resources that they need to survive. Uh, many of these birds that I mentioned are that were born further north. Um, they're going to be coming into Maine and New Hampshire uh, on their way south. And depending on the different species of birds, they're going to be using different kind of migration strategies. Um, but in this image, I wanted to also point out kind of the timeline of migration, because I, the last couple of years I've been really intrigued by um, shorebird migration, because shorebirds are the birds that actually start migrating south first. They're going to be uh, essentially following the sun. Um, many of these small shorebirds that have wintered down in South America, they come north and they breed right around the solstice. And once they're done breeding, they are out of there. And so by late July, many of our shorebird species uh, start to head south again. So the timeline progresses, and progresses into August, uh, where you have most of our shorebirds coming through. And then you probably also notice the nighthawks coming through in late August, along with a lot of those other aerial insectivorous birds, the swifts, the swallows, many of the flycatchers in late August and early September. 
by September, you're starting to get that big pulse of songbirds, the warblers, the thrushes, the wrens, the vireos, the tanagers, uh, the hummingbirds, broad-winged hawks make a huge migration in mid-September. Going into October, you start getting uh, bird species that aren't exactly dependent on insects. You, got, you get uh, larger birds like the ducks, the geese, the herons. Um, you get birds that are dependent on seeds. Um, so seeds that can stick around are persistent into fall and winter, birds like the sparrows. Um, and then you get a lot of those uh, hawks that actually are going to be feeding on those songbirds coming through in October, sharp-shinned hawks and cooper's hawks, as well as merlins, which are small falcon. By November, you're starting to get that waning migration. Um, but again, you start, you can continue getting some of those large bodied birds like the eagles and cranes. But then you're starting to get some of those really late Arctic breeding birds, um, like the snow buntings and horde larks and American tree sparrow, the birds that start to come into Maine and New Hampshire for the winter time. So it's really cool um, to follow the timeline of fall migration. Whereas in spring, all of these birds are powered by hormones to get north uh, and to get busy and to have those young. In the fall, they're not guided so much by that imperative to breed. So they actually take their time in the fall and fall migration is so drawn out. Um, that's what makes it partially interesting, I think. The fall, you're gonna have more birds to see because it's going to be adults plus the young birds coming. Um, so that's pretty exciting. Plus on top of that, many of our birds utilize an oval or an elliptical type migration. In spring, a lot of these birds, and you can look at the map for this, will be going on uh, over land um, up from South America, and they'll make that jump over to the um, continental United States through the Gulf of Mexico up to the boreal forest um, where they'll breed. But in the fall, many of our birds shift migration east to the east coast of the United States. And many of them do that because they take advantage of fall weather conditions, really strong um, late fall cold fronts that blast off of the eastern United States and greatly reduce the amount of energy needed to fly south to South America which is incredible. A lot of these birds that you think of as being seen in the understory of the forest, the dark forest, are going to be flying for days at a time over the open ocean to get down to their wintering habitats. So the fall just has a really unique story to tell um, a lot more birds and a lot more diversity. We get some species in the fall that we do not get in the spring, at least in uh, bigger numbers. So some migration strategies. Breeding residents are birds that we have year round, birds like our cardinals and downy woodpeckers. I have specifically not focused this talk so much on our breeding resident birds. Many of them we're very familiar with um, and we'll see a lot of them at Brownfield Bog, but I'm not going to share much information about them tonight because we have a lot of other species to get through. Similarly, wintering migrants. These are going to be birds that uh, arrive here later in the fall and spend the winters here. Birds like the mentioned American tree sparrow and snowy owl. Breeding migrants are really what we're going to be focusing on tonight. Uh, birds that are really only here for the summertime um, that, that utilize the, the, you know, the relatively short um, summer warm period to raise their young here in the Northern Hemisphere, uh, Maine and New Hampshire. We've got both short distance breeding migrants, birds like our red winged blackbirds and woodcocks. But we also have long distance breeding migrants like the broad winged hawk uh, shown here and the red eyed vireo. So these are the birds that we're gonna be um, kind of most focused on some of these long distance migrants for the talk tonight. Some other strategies, we've got eruptive migrants, which we really like to focus on at Christmas bird count, um, because of the, many of these birds are going to be only seeing in the wintertime, birds like common red poles, evening grosbeaks, pine grosbeaks, um, here's a red pole. Um, we're also going to be talking about, uh, on tonight's program, some passage migrants. These are birds that breed to our north and winter to our south. So we only see them on migration. Um, one uh, example of a passage migrant is the white crowned sparrow. Another is the American golden plover. And then nomads are birds that literally breed 
wherever the food is. Red Cross bills are a really good um, example and budgies down in Australia, the parrot, um, parakeet. These are birds that just kind of follow the food and when the food's plentiful, no matter the time of year, they will breed and raise their young. So we're not really going to focus on nomads um, tonight either, because again, um, they're fairly common. The red crossbills and white-winged crossbills, they're more often seen in winter here, and so we'll, um, we'll skip that for another talk. All right, so I've uh, gone ahead and taken out some of the slides from um, last summer's uh, talk that I did on shorebirds for Tin Mountain, and I pulled out a number of species that we're likely to see at Brownfield Bog. So the first is semi-palmated plover. Um, kind of to incorporate all of these shorebirds uh, with a couple statements, firstly being they're all pretty small. Um, these are all going to be about sparrow size. So really just a couple a uh, couple inches tall. They're going to be harder to find because they're going to be um, in the kind of late summer uh, marshy foliage. But many of them, and we'll go through some of the strategies that they employ, um, many of them will be uh, kind of in open shallow areas where uh, we, we should be able to see them without you know, working too hard um, and that sort of thing. So we'll, we'll talk a little bit about it. The first being the semi-palmated plover, which you will see at Maine and New Hampshire beaches this time of year. Um, it looks a lot like a killdeer, um, the killdeer, which is the larger plover that we have in open fields. Um, this one just has one ring. And in the fall, they are much more uh, faded. I went ahead and, and kind of um, on the top of this image, I have kind of the summer breeding plumage, and in the bottom, I have the the winter non-breeding plumage and the what the younger birds typically look like. So usually in the shorebirds, and in the case of many of our songbirds, um, the young and the non-breeding plumage are basically a super faded version of the um, adult slash um, breeding plumage. So this is a bird that really loves worms and the great photo on the bottom left, they love to pull out worms almost like a robin. And similarly, if you ever watch a robin on the grass feeding, they're always kind of moving and then stopping and listening and moving and then stopping and listening. That's a lot like how the plovers are when they are feeding. So if we see semi-palmated plovers in, in kind of um, open mud flats in the bog, that's what we'll be looking for is that kind of feeding behavior. Behavior. Along with um, that uh, semi-palmated plover, we should be seeing leaf sandpiper. This is the smallest um, sandpiper in the world. Um, the leaf sandpiper is, uh, again, sparrow-sized, likes to um, be more inland than many of our other sandpipers on migration. So they're often seen higher up on the um, shoreline, kind of closer to um, like the forest edge, but still working um, the, the mud flats uh, often away from the water, but very much so um, near water. This bird generally kind of a brownish sandpiper, um, short but slightly down curved bill and what's really helpful for identification is those yellowish legs. So that's going to be helpful um, in identifying this one um, compared to some of the other species that we have that look really similar. This one is uh, really common. This is a species um, Unlike the two prior, so the two uh, shorebirds that we just saw, those are passage migrants. They breed further north than where we live. Spotted sandpiper, however, breeds along our rivers here in New England. So this is really common, um, likely to be seen at Brownfield Bog. Um, it, they have kind of an eye line, so a strike through the eye that's really helpful for ID. They have that white mark along their wings, which is really great. They also have a really unique flight style. When they're flying, they keep their wings horizontal um, to the land surface, but then they'll flap their wings slightly down um, as they're going. So they'll like glide and, and slap their wings down a little bit. So it's a really uh, a unique flight style. Um, so we should be seeing them at the bog. They love fresh water. Um, they'll also be seen down on um, down on the coast in saltwater too, uh, but they're they're breeding on fresh water and they're starting to head south. Uh, so we should be seeing them. Along with um, 
those, we should be seeing uh, the larger, greater yellow legs. This uh, aptly named shorebird um, is more, I would say, blue jay size, so a little bit larger than the others that we've been seeing. This bird has a, a longer, up, slightly upturned bill. And so you'll be seeing them in deeper water where they're able to get out further away from the shoreline and walking around in deeper water, all kind of like a heron would or an egret and stabbing that bill into the, um, into the mud, looking for um, aquatic invertebrates and that sort of thing. The greater yellow legs, um, not to be confused with lesser yellow legs, which is the smaller cousin of the greater. In the upper right hand photo, you can see a comparison photo of the two species. So lesser yellow legs, um, compa uh, comparatively smaller than the greater, shorter bill, um, straight bill, not upturned. This bill is about the same uh, length as the head versus the greater yellow legs, which has that stronger upturned bill it's about twice the length of the head. So what we should be seeing this bird, again, feeding in a very similar fashion in shallow pools at the bog. Solitary sandpiper, this is a denizen of fresh water. They really actually will um, tend to avoid saltwater habitats. Um, this is a bird that's passage migrant. They breed um, further north. What's fascinating about this bird, they, they will, um, what do they call it? Secondary, secondary, I'll think of the word. But anyway, they use the nests of songbirds. So they don't make, make their own nests. They lay their eggs in often in thrush and robin nests uh, much further north, which is really cool in trees. So um, amazing to think of a shorebird hanging out in a tree and nesting in a tree. But that's what they do. Um, this bird, uh, very active, again, feeding in the shallows. Um, on our rivers and, and streams and ponds and lakesides. Lo they love small bodies of water. Um, and we should be seeing them anywhere where the water inundates the, the, um, the road at Brownfield Bog, we should be seeing them. Um, and I'm just gonna go back one slide to show you how similar they look to the lesser yellow legs. So note the lesser, lesser yellow legs kind of spotted throughout the wing it has a slight eye ring, that sort of thing. Well, go forward. Um, notice this bird has a bold eye ring. Um, this bird's also much browner in its wing. Um, it's, it's spotting kind of ends right at the leading edge of the wing there. Um, and it's, it's about the same size, a, part, a little bit smaller than the lesser yellow legs. So they're gonna be very similar in size, but those legs are short and they're more olive. So they're darker uh, than the lesser yellow legs, but it's, it's a tough bird to um, distinguish from the lesser, uh, but hopefully we'll see both of them on our trip next weekend. So we can ID them and uh, talk more about maybe their differences in feeding style and maybe the differences in their behavior. Um, Cause it's, it's really interesting when you get out there and you start to see the flight differences um, of a lot of these birds are really helpful for IDing them. Um, so pictures can only do um, so much, but it's a great introduction. And then finally, um, the Wilson snipe is a breeding migrant that lives at the bog. They breed there, they um, hang out there into the fall. Um, there are related to the woodcock. So they're kind of chunkier, they're rounder. They um, they do spend a lot of time higher up in the marsh, kind of where it's a little drier. Um, you'll see them in um, kind of corners of fields where there's a little wet spot on migration. When they fly, you see um, really bold white striping on their back. Um, notice their faces also have that really unique striping. Um, again, the eye line is really helpful for this particular bird and a really long bill, much like um, the woodcock. So this bird um, will use that long bill again to get those um, invertebrates and uh, other insects and worms in the, in the marsh. And uh, hopefully we'll see them. We probably won't see them displaying because that's more of a, a spring and summer uh, behavior. But if you come back in May, you'll get to see the, um, the Wilson snipes do their amazing aerial flights, uh, which make a funny um, winnowing call, um, which is just really unique.
So um, that's it for the shorebirds. I kept it few uh, because there are a lot of other species to cover. Um, and those are kind of the ones that are most likely to be seen. So we'll also talk about some of the hawks that are coming through. Um, one of our breeding migrant hawks is the red-tailed. Um, they're actually, I would actually go back and say they're, they're resident. Um, breeding residents. So red tails um, are here in the winter time as well. Um, they can be tough to identify when you're just like seeing them quickly, but look at those shoulders, those that's called the um, the Pelagia, it's kind of the, the leading edge um, of the wing closer to the head. That's usually that's usually dark in the uh, red-tailed hawk. Of course, the tail is a telltale sign, the size, they're a big bird. Also across the chest, there's often this banding, the belly band, we call it. That's really helpful in identifying the red tail. Um, when we see them, it'll be obvious. They're just a big bird uh, that are gonna be, you know, hanging out in the trees, looking for larger uh, rodents and um, small mammals. That's their, that's their thing. Not so much fish like our osprey, or birds like our Cooper and Sharp Shinned Hawks. These are, these are kind of pounce on mammal hawks. Similarly um, is the less common red-shouldered hawk. And I added um, two photos of the red-shouldered hawk below, both of which are um, more typical of the immature bird. Again, we don't have this um, species in huge numbers, but they are becoming more common in New England. So it's definitely a bird to keep on your radar. They're really common in Florida. Um, they have really neat banding across their wings and tail. Um, these are individual, these individuals are immature birds. And what's a really helpful ID mark for this bird um, in comparing it to a really close relative to broad wing talk is um, the, the really light what, what are called crescents and I'm gonna I'm gonna um, move my mouse over them so right on the leading edge of uh, the wing before it starts getting into those um, emarginated fingers here um, this area here which is mirrored on the other side especially when backlit by the sun um, really stand out. So that's an awesome ID mark for this species is those um, those pale kind of crescents that appear right at the end of the wing. Um, Broadwing hawks don't have that. Um, in the adult birds, you do get that more like uniform reddish coloration, uh, which is really helpful in identification. And many of these ID marks will also be flushed out in later Tin Mountain programs as well. But hopefully we'll see a red shouldered hawk because again, they're not so, so common. More common will be our broadwing hawk, and that's the two birds on the top left and two birds on the bottom left um, in this image. Uh, the two birds on the top are immature birds. Again, you see those uh, nice banding um, pattern, barring pattern on the wings and tail, very similar to the red-shouldered hawk. Um, but again, you're not going to be getting that um, that crescent out at the end of the the wing, um, which is helpful for the um, ID for the red-shouldered. Um, really great helpful ID mark of the of the adult broad-winged hawk is that beautiful black and white short tail, um, stubby bird overall, broad wings kind of wide wings, um, really great for riding thermals, those warm air currents that show up in the afternoon. These birds, again, are, are mammal pouncers. So they're gonna be hanging out in the woods and dropping down on mammals um, as best they can, but they're all gonna be moving south in the next couple of weeks and they all go pretty much together. So it's a really cool um, spectacle of migration to see the broad-winged hawks head south. Later in the year, you'll get the sharp shinned hawks and the Cooper's hawks moving through. Both are in the occipiter genus, and the occipiters are bird hawks. So they're really good at flying very fast through the woods in dense uh, foliage, going after other very fast birds. Um, both have heavy barring, long uh, tails with stripes on them, um, but there's some subtle differences. The sharp shin is going to be smaller, generally. Um, versus the Coopers, which is going to be larger. sharp -shinned hawks, um, we say they have this like angry parakeet face. So they they have this uh, kind of have their eyes more 
kind of set to the side so they kind of look goofy a little bit more so than the coopers which have their eyes kind of set forward on the face a little bit more cooper's hawks larger more robust hawk they also have a capped appearance so versus in this image you can't see it so well um, because uh, this is actually an immature bird in the top right, but the adults have more of a hooded appearance. So that dark kind of um, navy blue coloration goes all the way down the back versus the Cooper's Hawk, which has almost like a little um, toupee on top of its head. So there are a few different field marks for that. And um, hopefully we'll be able to see some of these birds in the wild uh, during our trip um, to Brownfield Bog. Very likely, um, we will be seeing the Northern Harrier. So Northern Harrier, um, very different kind of hawk uh, than the others. This is um, a species that has relatives worldwide. It lives a life almost like an owl. It, it's just a unique bird. If you look at its face, its head's very small, but it has um, these beautiful facial discs, much like an owl, that um, the discs kind of sunken into the into the face that allow them to trap um, sound as they're looking down onto the landscape. These are uh, mammal hunters, in some cases will eat birds, but a lot of the time they drop down onto mammals um, and they do a lot of gliding and kiting. Um, and uh, much thinner wings, long tail, um, but very active and very, um, very much low to the ground soaring. So if you see them, they're likely going to be in and out of the foliage flying. It's going to be hard to keep an eye on them because they're going to be so close to the ground. In all plumages, in all sexes, they have a white rump. This is a male called the gray ghost, and they have a white rump. This is a female. Um, and this it will also have that white rump. So that's really helpful to see that um, uh, on this bird. Uh, so really special bird and, and hopefully we'll see this um, uh, the uh, bog. All right, so we'll get into some falcons. So falcons are um, very adept at flying fast um, after uh, fast moving prey. In the case of peregrine and merlin, they are bird specialists. They, they will go after fast birds. Um, both of them love to eat shorebirds, um, love to eat, uh, in the case of the, of the fal peregrine falcon, loves to eat um, pigeons um, and ducks. Uh, Merlins love to go after, um, we see them go after uh, cedar wax wings all the time. Kestrels, a little, a little less like quick. They're, they're a bit more, not lazy, but they definitely, um, they kind of, they go after smaller prey, insects, uh, flying insects. They're going to be, you're going to see kestrels more in a field habitat, whereas merlins and peregrines are going to see open, um, just like seaside and uh, urban habitats. So that sort of thing. And both of, all three have a really unique shape, very pointed, thin wings, um, kind of triangular tail. Uh, can dive really fast if they if they want to, um, and lots of barring. So you'll see that in um, in all three birds. Uh, peregrines kind of have that steel steel gray, almost navy blue on the back, just like a a beautiful, um, powerful bird of prey. Very um, large compared to the other two here. They're going to be they're going to be about the size, a little a little larger than the. Cooper's hawk if you're going to see them out and about um, in terms of size comparisons, whereas the Merlin is, you know, going to be blue jay size. Kestrel is going to be morning dove size, so they're going to be much smaller. But they'll all utilize the brownfield bog for different food types um, on their on their migrations. And um, the Kestrels, all three too, are going to have a migration that's kind of extended into the fall. So you'll see all three of these birds in, well into November in, in you know, lower numbers, um, but it's not uncommon to get them later into the year. Um, and then two birds that are very likely to be seen, um, the osprey and the bald eagle. Um, I just chose photos that are kind of diagnostic of their flight pattern. The eagle has this like stiff uh, two by four looking um, shape, just really long, broad wings um, that are just 
you know, just kind of held in place like that. Uh, very exaggerated, but just really, you know, it, it, uh, it's something you're going to see when you watch the eagles fly around and soar. Um, Osprey, that charismatic bend in the wings, um, black and white um, plumage, really they're not going to change their colors throughout the year. They're, they're really, they're one thing. Um, they'll, they'll all head down South, uh, in the next, uh, couple weeks too. So they're going to be headed out, um, usually gone, uh, by early October. All right. So we've moved through shorebirds, we've moved through raptors, and now we're going to get into the the hard stuff. So um, we're going to be looking through a number of different songbird groups uh, to round out the program. So the first group are the vireos. The vireos are songbirds that look like warblers. They have small bodies. They have short, th thin bills. Um, but uh, some features that sh that set them apart from basically all warblers. Uh, bill shape, thick bills, hooked bills. Um, these guys are insect eaters, uh, but they all have hooked bills. Um, warblers don't. Warblers have thin, sharp bills that end in a point. Um, something else that's really helpful. Uh, Vireos have blue to blue-gray legs and feet. Um, that's really helpful. You're not going to see that coloration in the warblers. Um, so that's really, really helpful in many of our vireos. Um, it's going to be especially helpful because, you know, for instance, red-eyed vireo doesn't have the blue, gray, uh, blue gray. It's more just gray, but, um, warbling and Philadelphia, they have these, these uh, leg colors, which helped set them apart from very similar looking uh, warblers, such as the Tennessee warbler, which we'll get into. Warbling vireo, really common uh, swamp and wetland, forested wetland vireo. Um, they, they're at the Brownfield Bog all spring and summer. Very um, kind of faded yellowish uh, with gray top, slight eye line. Um, just kind of plain looking. Um, when you see it, you you won't. Nothing will really be striking um, about this bird. But it's. I think it's a. It has a really beautiful song in the spring and summer. Um, very similar looking to the Philadelphia vireo. So Philadelphia vireo is a passage migrant for our area. They breed in um, northern New Hampshire and Maine and up into the Canadian boreal forest. If you look at them, they have a more extensive uh, golden yellow from their throat all the way back to their vent. So they're much um, more yellow than the warbling. Uh, a subtle but helpful ID mark is that the Philadelphia Vireo's eye line extends all the way to the bill versus the warbling, which ends just ahead of the eye. So that's tough unless you're seeing these birds well in a, in a pair of binoculars or a scope. So otherwise, look for that strong yellow coloration um, and that vireo bill, um, and, and you'll get it. Very similar uh, in terms of its yellow coloration is the yellow-throated vireo, another uh, kind of swamp wetland vireo, much more common further south, um, but we, we're at the northern end of their range, and they breed at uh, Brownfield Bog, yellow-throated vireo has um, a beautiful kind of yellow throat and bib, and then it kind of immediately goes to white. They also have yellow spectacles or kind of like glasses. So that's really helpful. Another vireo that has glasses is the one to the right, the blue-headed vireo, one that breeds just to our north in the mixed uh, hardwood, softwood forests, higher elevation forests. They have kind of a steel blue-gray cap um, and uh, you can't see it here, but they have a really beautiful kind of greenish back with um, white wing bars. So that's really a, a very uh, easy to identify vireo. Again, it has that um, big 
you know, Bill, the Vireo Bill um, with the hook at the end. And then finally, red-eyed Vireo, our most common Vireo um, found all over New England in the hardwood forest, sings all day um, from the tops of the trees. And this one, again, another plain Vireo, but really uh, a dark eye line, dark cap, white eyebrow, um, and red eyes. So uh, if you can see that in your binoculars or scope, um, you'll, you'll see the red eyes. But that's not, you know, you don't need to see the eyes to know that you're seeing a red-eyed vireo. Um, so these are our vireos. They're slightly larger than the warblers, a little bit chunkier, a little bit more imposing, a little slower moving, which is really important too. The larger the bird, generally the slower the moving, the movement. So that's really helpful um, when you're looking at a mixed flock of all of these things moving through, because they're not just going to be on their own. They're going to be mixed in with the residents, the the breeding, um, the breeding residents like our chickadees and titmice and nuthatches and things like that. Um, along with warblers and thrushes and things. So it's uh, it, it'll be a mix and it'll be confusing and frustrating, but it'll be exciting and a fun challenge um, for those who would like to, uh, to get more into it. All right, so I'm gonna try to move my mouse off that so we can make that go away. Um, going into our flycatchers. So many of our flycatchers are going to be headed through now. Um, and these flycatchers, again, as their name suggests, they, they eat insects on the wing. Um, they are all of, for the most part, all of these are going to be breeding here in New England um, and are going to be found to greater or lesser degrees at the at the bog. Starting with the most common is the Eastern Phoebe on the lower left. In, you know, looking at all of these different birds, um, you'll see that they um, they have varying degrees of wing bars. Um, they have varying degrees of uh, kind of facial patterning. Um, the Eastern Phoebe, very plain, very kind of um, nondescript. Uh, the, the wing bars are there, but they're fairly faded. Phoebes also bob their tails um, religiously, so that's really helpful. Um, and they're one of the, the latest uh, uh, flycatchers to move through. Least flycatcher will be one of the first to leave along with alder flycatcher. Least flycatchers are the smallest of the flycatchers. Um, when they when they land, they're not going to be moving their tails at all. It's kind of like, it's kind of wild. They remind me of um, of like a bell, they they fly up to a to a twig, and they're they're moving as they're flying, but then they land, and then they almost go motionless. Um, just a really cool kind of uh, flight pattern. They're very quick, but then they stop, um, and a lot of the flycatchers do that. Um, and they'll be sitting at a branch, and they'll fly out and grab grab an insect. Lee's flycatcher has a bold eye ring, bold white wing bars. Um, it has more of a gray. Um, contrasting with uh, white on the on the belly, um, so versus the alder flycatcher in the lower right, which is more of an olive gray cast to it, less of an eye ring, uh, but again, you're going to get those wing bars, going to have a slightly longer tail, um, but otherwise, you know, if if you're not super comfortable with the flycatchers, that's just fine. I have a lot of trouble with them, um, and so it can be it can be tough um, IDing them for sure. The eastern wood peewee, um, they are the kind of the largest of these uh, flycatchers that are assembled here. They they have kind of a peaked head. They often will raise their feathers, their head feathers into a peak to form kind of like a triangle. They have really long um, primary projections, which means that the, the wing tips go um, really far down their back. So that can be helpful when you're when you're watching them. Um, in, in the field that that you notice, oh, this this bird's wingtips are are quite long. I know it's a flycatcher. It you know it's 
kind of a chunky flycatcher, a little bit, um, it's larger than a Phoebe. It very well could be an Eastern wood peewee. Um, to the right, the yellow-bellied flycatcher, I think that's one of the easier ones to identify because it has like an olive yellow cast to its entire body. So if you see a small flycatcher that, ha that has this you know, strange yellow appearance to it, you're dealing with a yellow-bellied flycatcher. This is a passage migrant from, from further north. We get them in the White Mountains and in boreal forests of uh, Western and Northern Maine, uh, but they don't breed at Brownfield Bog, but they are coming through right now. So that's exciting. Um, alder flycatcher looks identical to willow flycatcher, which also is found in New England and around here. The only way to tell them apart in the field is through uh, voice. And because it's fall, they're not going to be vocalizing very much, if at all. So, um, so a while back, alder and willow flycatchers were called one species, trails flycatcher. So that's often what you can um, what, what you'll hear people reporting this flycatcher as uh, is trails or alder slash willow. So I did not include willow in this only because it looks just like the alder. All right, so moving along to the thrushes, um, another larger bodied bird similar to the vireos with a, a you know, slightly hooked bill as well. These are basically two-toned in the case of um, the thrushes, uh, brown, olive brown, and white is kind of the color palette you're looking at with varying degrees of spotting on the throat and the upper breast. So getting into each of these though, um, you can see some field marks that help identify our thrushes. I think the most, the most uh, prominent um, kind of the, the king of the thrushes is the wood thrush. Um, it has like a brick red um, top of the head, back of the neck, down to the wings, much like a brown thrasher, which I did not include in this presentation. Um, brown thrashers are more common in um, open lens, uh, agricultural settings and thickets. Um, I have seen them at Brownfield Bog, but I didn't include that. So if you think about wood thrush, they have um, black spotting and this beautiful um, russet back, very similar to um, the coloration of a brown thrasher. But if you look at its face, it has black um, coloration in its cheek, which is really helpful to identify it um, away from the other thrushes uh, pictured here. Those spots on the chest are kind of in triangles, um, which is really helpful too. Those black spots are in little mini triangles, which is, uh, I think, really beautiful. Um, moving down, uh, the viri. Viri is uh, another kind of riverside, um, lowland forest, deciduous forest um, thrush. They are um, kind of a not so brick red, but they are kind of a reddish orange. Um, that reddish orange extends into the throat, which ex which um, kind of blends into a, a solid kind of whitish belly. In the field, it'll appear, you know, m more whiter than in this photo. But the viris. Uh, and the rest of the thrushes are going to be spending a lot of time either out of sight uh, or they're going to be walking around on the ground like their cousins, the American robins. So that'll be helpful um, to see them moving about. Um, I'm going to jump over to Swainson's thrush on the bottom right uh, because they are also going to be migrating through right around now. Uh, they're not so much reddish, they're more olive to gray on their back, but they have um, on, an orange kind of tone in their face, and they appear to have more of a, um, a, a uh, eye ring or spectacles, like um, burnt orange honey colored spectacles and upper um, breast and throat area with uh, those brown spots. Um, they also, in the field, Swainson's thrush, they also have a long primary projection, um, meaning their, their leading edge of their wings, the primary wing feathers, um, appear, appear very long, which in the field, when they are tucked back along their back, make their tail look really short. So that's a helpful um, ID mark versus the bird above it, the hermit thrush, which has a shorter wing progression, uh, 
projection and what appears to be a longer tail. The hermit thrush, um, again, kind of brown, uh, dark brown on top with a russet tail. So that two-toned color is really helpful. Hermit thrushes spend a lot of time on the ground feeding. Um, one ID mark for them is that they lift their tail up and then slowly bring it down. So you'll see that a lot when you're watching thrushes. Um, you'll notice that the hermits do that. Um, and they're, they're breeding, res, uh, breeding migrant, I should say, and they're spending their time um, uh, just a little bit further north and more of the mixed conifer um, deciduous forest. Um, whereas Swainson's is more restricted to the boreal forests and higher elevations. I did not include the Bicknell's thrush here because it's really unlikely that we'll see it, even though they are technically migrating through. Um, that would be really great, great if we saw it, uh, but um, for the sake of confusion, um, I left that one out. Um, but I will keep the gray catbird in, um, you know, a little distant relative of the of the thrushes. This is in the mimic thrush family, the gray catbird, um, related to the um, brown thrasher and the northern mockingbird. Um, all three that we have in, in Maine and New Hampshire, gray catbirds are really common at the bog, uh, you know, slate gray um, throughout with that russet undertail or vent area. Um, so we should be seeing quite a few of these at the bog and they'll be migrating through um, in September and uh, depending on how much fruit is available in the late fall and how warm it is in the late fall, they'll, they'll stick around. Um, we've had them in North Conway well into, uh, well into October and early November um, as, as long as there's food supply. And I added a warbler here that looks a lot like a thrush that people often confuse for one. This is the oven bird, spends a lot of time on the ground. Um, they have a big, bold white eye ring, heavy spotting uh, on, on the white um, belly, but also have this beautiful um, red crest that can be um, raised and lowered uh, that's, that's uh, bordered by uh, two black lines just above the eye. Uh, this is a smaller bird. So, you know, if you see it on its own, you might think it's a thrush. If you see it right next to one, you're going to say, oh, that bird's much smaller. Um, I don't know if it's a thrush, but it looks a lot like one. It's very likely that you're looking at an oven bird. Okay, speaking of warblers, we're going to get through our warblers um, fairly quickly. We just have um, just a little while left. I might go over time, but that's okay. I have chosen, uh, I, I use all the same warblers that I use in my spring talk, except for Louisiana water thrush. Louisiana water thrush is an earlier fall migrant. So they get out of here pretty pretty soon in late August and it's likely that we won't see them. Um, however, they are, um, they are around uh, the bog and other points um, north and west uh, in our area. Um, but I used all the same warblers from the talk that I made in springtime, but all of these are in the non-breeding slash immature phase of their plumage. So they're going to be tough to identify, um, but that's why we've got them pictured here and we're going to go on our walk in a week and uh, hopefully see some of them. Morning warbler in the upper left. Um, this is a chunky gr uh, ground dwelling warbler that is um, kind of olive, uh, olive above, yellow below. It appears to have a short tail, but that's partially because it's under tail covert feathers extend really far down the tail. So it makes its tail look really short. They have yellow that extends up into the throat. They often have varying degrees of white, uh, a very thin white um, eye, um, eye line or not eye line, um, the line that goes around the eye. I'm blanking on it right now. But anyway, I'll, it'll come back to me. So um, similarly below the Canada warbler um, has that big eye look as well because the white that's surrounding surrounding the eye. Um, also going to have that yellow throat, um, but their back is more that slate gray um, look to it. You might on the Canada warbler get varying degrees of that necklace that the, the males have in spring, um, but the fall it's, it's usually fairly faded. Um, but that intense yellow um, bordering on that slate gray is really helpful. Um, in the lower right, you've got Wilson's warbler, 
um, it is a yellow warbler, but its um, upper parts are green, kind of darker uh, green yellow. So you have that, um, you definitely have that uh, uh, kind of demarcation when you see this bird in the field. It also has, um, that has varying degrees of that black cap in the Wilsons that you'll see um, in the male and then partially in the female breeding plumage. So um, you should get some of that in the fall, but it's not, um, it might not be very conspicuous. American Red Start above, um, that has some yellow in the armpit area and patches on the wings and tail. Otherwise, um, dark olive uh, grading into kind of a, a steel gray um, face and white throat. Um, American Red Start feeding in the fall, just like in the spring, it's gonna be darting around um, actually similar to the Wilsons. Both of these birds hang their wings out um, while they're feeding. So they kind of they look a little lazy, like they're opening their wings a lot more. In the case of the Red Start, they do that. They open their wings up to chase in, to startle insects out of hiding places. Um, they'll open their tail and wings up at the same time in the Red Start. Um, so both of those, the Wilsons and Red Start are very active feeders. Um, and you'll see them you know, in thick brush, uh, but moving very quickly. So you'll see them moving, but you won't always get a great look at them because they're constantly on the move. Um, some of the other earlier warbler migrants that we have, yellow warbler in the upper left, which is a common breeder at the bog, um, uniform yellow um, from the face all the way down to the tail, as yellow in the wings, yellow in the tail, um, and a slight um, slight amount of yellow right around the eye as well. Um, a little bit of yellow in the northern perula on its throat and chest. Otherwise, it's going to be kind of a rainbow of colors, um, greenish bluish cast to the top of the bird um, with white eye arc, so a partial eye ring above and below. See, there's that word, eye ring. So. Um, in the uh, northern perula, this is going to be a smaller warbler appearing smaller in the field, um, but uh, white wing bars help to um, identify that bird, but a cacophony of color in the perula, really stunning bird. Chestnut sided also kind of has greenish on top, but this is more like an electric green um, in the chestnut sided um, with kind of dirty green white wing bars and a completely plain grayish um, throat and belly. There's no streaking. It's just one color all the way back to the vent, which is really helpful. Um, so that green mixed with that gray white is really, really helpful. There's not going to be any other warblers that have that color combo. Um, black and white warbler, you probably have, if you've been birding for a while, know this bird. Um, it, it, very easy to identify, walks up and down tree trunks like a nuthatch. Also its vent area, the, the lower um, the lower portion of the tail has these black points on it, these little black, what are called chevrons or, or um, triangles that point outward. Um, so if you only see the rear end of this bird, that's the only uh, warbler that has that uh, plumage um, characteristics. So that's really helpful. Um, but they, uh, they'll also be, well, one of the, one of the first warblers out of here this fall. So, um, I, I'm sad to see them go. Uh, I love, they're one of my favorite warblers. Absolutely. Um, but they'll be headed out in the next couple weeks. Um, moving into some of the warblers that's, that you can see a little later into the, into the uh, migration. We've got black throated green in the upper left. Um, it has yellow cheek. It has a green kind of cast to the upper head and back. Otherwise, it has a like blackish streaking over white, cream white belly and two white wing bars, which is really helpful. Um, black throated green stick around kind of later into September, um, along with black Bernian warbler below. Black Bernian warbler, again, two white wing bars. Um, but this is a bird that people mistake for other things, but take a look at its face. That's really helpful to ID. Look at the um, kind of cream yellow uh, supercilium or eyebrow. That's really helpful with that kind of black, uh, or d I wouldn't say black necessarily, but darker um, grayish uh, spot um, right on the face there um, that you know, kind of goes between the eyebrow and the throat that are the same color that um, kind of uh, 
yellowish cream color there. It's, it's subtle, um, but that's, as you might remember in springtime, um, that color gets replaced with that flaming red sunset um, of, a, of plumage that the males are so, the adult males are so well known for. Um, uh, Black-throated blue warbler in the upper right, this is a female. Um, I didn't include the male um, only, uh, again, for sake of time, but also because the males are stunningly um, obvious that black and blue and white plumage. Um, but the, the females are often misidentified. So males and females often have a little white spot on their wing, which you can see in this photo. Um, that's really helpful for ID, but the females also have a partial eye ring um, where the top of the eye has that very thin uh, white eyebrow and the bottom has that, that arc. So that's, a, that's the diagnostic for the female black throated blue. Um, Northern water thrush below, again, another bird that looks like a thrush, spends a lot of time in the ground, it bobs its tail pretty intensely, so that's really helpful. Moving methodically through the undergrowth very slowly with the bobbing of the tail, that's really helpful. Um, it made me remember that spotted sandpiper um, bobs its tail <laughs> and the solitary sandpiper bobs its kind of front end as it walks. So when we see those birds um, as we go through um, on Saturday, we'll remember those different behavior traits. But the northern water thrush likes to spend its time on the ground, big white supercilium, um, and very heavily streaked uh, throat through um, the chest. So that's really helpful. And varying degrees of pink leg, uh, which, is, which is nice to see. More warblers um, getting kind of to the warblers that I've seen later into September and October. Um, we have uh, Tennessee on the upper left. Tennessee warblers often get confused for red-eyed vireos, um, but Tennessee warblers in the fall are uniform green, um, greenish. They have a, a, a thin black eye line, which is really helpful. And to further help um, ID it, it has a white vent. Um, a warbler that we get in the fall in to a lesser degree uh, is the orange crown warbler and they look a lot like Tennessee, um, complete with an eye line um, and that kind of yellowish green um, plumage, but they have a, a yellow vent. So that's a helpful distinguishing mark. So the Tennessee has this white vent here along with a, a green cast, um, short sharp bill, um, which is really helpful. They'll, they'll in a lineup of warblers, um, they look like they have a much shorter, sharper bill than the others, in my opinion. Um, Nashville warbler below has kind of a, um, a grayish hood to it, um, which blends into yellow below and green on the back, no wing bars, fairly plain in that regard, but it has the white eye ring, which is helpful. Um, similarly looking bird to our right, uh, lower right, the um, common yellow throat with the varying degrees of blaze yellow in the throat um, with an olive back. So very plain warbler, spends a lot of time on the ground, skulking around, um, hiding in the undergrowth, a breeding bird at the bog, which we should see a lot of. Um, in the fall, the males should be retaining, the adult males should be retaining that black mask through the eyes. So it makes it even hard to see the eyes because they're covered by the, or blending in so well with the black uh, mask. Um, but again, this is that younger bird um, slash kind of female type plumage, which is, um, I think better for better for confusing us, better for challenging us to learn more about how these birds look um, in um, what's called their basic plumage. Um, birds, the songbirds have their alternate plumage, which is their breeding plumage, and their basic plumage, which is their non-breeding plumage. Bird in the upper right, that's our Cape May warbler. Again, uh, in this particular bird, gosh, compared to its adult male um, version, this one being an uh, immature, likely immature female type, very grayish um, looking, but but finely streaked in the throat through uh, the belly. Short, sharp bill that's slightly uh, down, uh, down curved or decurved. When it flies, it has um, a, a yellowish, all like greenish to yellowish uh, rump 
kind of like a yellow rumped warbler. So that's a that's a helpful ID mark when you see them. So basically all, all gray warbler with a uh, with fine lace, fine streaking on the throat and breast, um, and a and a yellow rump. And you've got a Cape May. Um, Cape Mays along with Tennessees are uh, nectar nectar eating birds in their winter grounds in Central and South America. So you'll start seeing them actually, uh, I've heard reports of Cape May warblers coming to hummingbird feeders in the fall and in, in bad weather in the springtime on their way north. Um, so that's a really unique um, kind of uh, behavior trait of these birds. All right, and two birds that often get confused. They, they get so confused, I put them on um, the same uh, slide so that we could really study them up. Uh, the black pole warbler and the bay breasted warbler. These are um, like the Tennessee and the Cape May are birds that breed much further north um, up in the boreal forests of Canada. Um, black pole actually gets as far south south as the White Mountains of New Hampshire, um, which is really helpful. Both uh, birds generally in the fall are gray green um, with kind of a cream belly uh, and two white wing bars. That's and, oh, and a dark eye line. So that's those are the four traits um, that make these birds who they are. That being said, uh, the diagnostic difference between these two birds is their foot color. Black pole warblers we say black pole yellow sole. That tells you uh, to look at the feet because in the black pole warbler, uh, some part of their foot will be uh, orange to yellow. It could be in the legs, it could be in the toes, it could be underneath the foot and on the pad itself. But some aspect of its um, uh, foot anatomy and leg anatomy will be yellow compared to bay breasted, never will have yellow. It'll be gray. Um, so that's helpful. That being said, it's not always easy to see the feet on these little birds that are moving constantly. Um, but that's that's how it is. There are some other um, uh, marks to help us. Uh, bay breasted often show a, a hint of brown um, on their lower flanks on the side of the bird. Um, nothing like what they look like in the, in the summer and the spring with that beautiful brown mask in the male of, of the bay breasted. Um, but that's retained to a small degree down in the flank area. Um, they often have a, uh, let's see, they often have a well, yellowish green appearance, the bay breasted versus the black pole, which is kind of a darker grayer green appearance. Um, which is helpful. In my experience, bay breasted warblers, when compared to black poles, appear larger um, overall. So those are um, a few different characteristics, but really focus on um, really focus on those feet. Black poles ex usually extend their migration into the fall, late fall. Um, they have a really cool migration. All of the black pole warblers from Alaska to Newfoundland migrate into northeastern Canada and, and northeastern United States and make a, a jump to hyperspace that I call it. Um, they, they all fly offshore to uh, Venezuela and Brazil um, following those cold fronts. Um, so they, they make an incredible journey across the northern tier of uh, of North America and fly all the way down to South America in a, in a couple days time over open ocean, which is incredible. Um, bay breasted warblers are usually out of here um, by late September, early October, but I've seen black poles into late October. Um, all right, so a couple more that stick around later into the fall. We have pine warbler up top. I included two photos because pine warblers are quite, um, they are quite variable in their plumage, um, but pine warblers have a uh, spectacles. Their, their, their coloration around the eye ring extends into um, the area above the bill. So it looks like they're wearing glasses. They also have white wing bars. Um, they're also a larger billed warbler, which is helpful when you're seeing them um, out in the field. They appear to have a larger bill. Um, but otherwise, they're going to be spending a lot of time in pine trees, at least in the spring and summer. Um, 
typically all bets are off in regard to habitat in the fall during and early spring and migration as they're headed north. Um, but for, but they're pretty faithful to their host trees, the the pines, the uh, the white and the um, and pitch pines at least in our area. So you you do get them. Um, but this warbler throws people off a lot. Magnolia warbler in the lower left. Um, this can be a tough one too for a lot of birders, um, but it has a couple different colors that that help it out. Um, it has kind of the, the a grayish hood um, with a bit of a white eye ring um, and that beautiful yellow belly. Um, but what it's not showing in this photo, but if you were to turn this bird around, the only warbler that I know of that has this coloration scheme is uh, is the follow the following. So it has yellow that extends down to the belly, and then it abruptly turns white from behind the legs all the way out to the uh, tip of the tail, and the end of the tail is jet black. So that's really diagnostic: yellow, white, black in the tail of the magnolia. Um, the, you know, the front end of it can be confusing because it looks kind of like an Asheville. It looks kind of like, um, you know, you might think it looks like a Canada, but um, if you can see the other end of the bird, that's really helpful, yellow to white to black. And then yellow rumped warbler, probably the latest warbler to stick around in New England uh, because they have a pretty wide ranging diet and can eat fruit, um, bay berries including, uh, included into the, into the winter season. They have varying amounts of yellow in their in their armpit area, but they will all have yellow in the rump. They have um, white eye arcs um, above and below the eye, and they often have they're often brown to gray, but they often have like a white bib. So the area below the bill uh, contrasts fairly sharply with a brownish to gray brown cheek and and top of the head. So th that's what helps me out because the yellow rump warbler will have varying degrees of, of streaking in its breast. So that doesn't really help me too much with the ID. Um, but if you get <clears throat> if you get the the white kind of bib with the with the brownish kind of grayish cast to the upper part of the of the face plus the yellow in the rump that's that's really great for the ID. All right, and we're pretty much wrapped up here and just some um, other species to kind of talk about. Um, I, uh, you're going to see these birds and you're going to confuse them for a lot of our warblers, um, but they're gonna be uh, in many cases gonna be larger than the warblers. We've got rose rusted grosbeak, um, big bill, big white supercilium, brownish when they fly, um, the, the males are going to have red in their armpit. The females are going to have orange, yellow. Um, so they're around in the fall. Bobolinks have this um, beautiful kind of go, uh, golden hue to them, heavily streaking on the on the back. They're going to be out in um, fields, but they're also going to be, you know, they come to like wild rice in in many of our marshes too. So they'll be around. Um, Scarlet tanager, the males that are brilliant. Um, red and black in the summer, they uh, they they turn to um, kind of golden yellow with black wings in the fall. They eat fruit. Um, they'll be around. Uh, American goldfinch, similar coloration to the scarlet tanager in the fall, but they're going to be um, often lower to the ground, small, much smaller in the field. They're going to be in groups, faster f flying. Again, that rule of larger birds fly slower generally. So you're going to get um, the American goldfinch's more erratic flight. You'll see them around this weekend, I'm sure. Red winged blackbirds in big flocks, they breed there as well. Um, males and females look this kind of like uh, drab gray and uh, gray brown and white. Um, uh, or faded brown and white uh, to them, very sharp bill, they'll be around, um, along with indigo bunting, which is a goldfinch sized um, bird uh, that you'll see around, again, similar to the bobolink in its color scheme, um, but will a very plain face, very uh, skulky, very furtive. You're gonna, you're, you're. It's gonna be hard to see, um, but hopefully we'll get some good looks of the of the buntings as well. And I also added Baltimore Oriole because they'll be around too, and they're not gonna be as exciting as they are in spring because their colors typically fade um, back to uh, the the basic plumage of um, off yellow, gray with the um, white wing bar there. 
again, really long, sharp bill, nectar eating, insect eating too, um, but the, they'll be they'll be around. And again, kind of harder to see. Many of these birds have more of the more of a shy behavior in the fall because they they really aren't interested in breeding. Their hormones aren't telling them to get active and sing, so they really don't show off as much as they do in springtime. So it's going to be harder to see them. They're going to be kind of hiding in the foliage. Um, and my final, promise you, my final slide, uh, just kind of a wrap up of some of the other small birds we might see. Um, our sparrows uh, on the left, the song and the swamp are breeding migrants um, in the bog. Lincoln sparrow is a passage migrant. Um, <clears throat> song sparrows have heavy barring. They often have a dark spot on their chest and they have black handlebar mustache, the malar uh, stripe on their uh, below their bill is really helpful to identify the song sparrow also has a long tail. Lincoln Sparrow, finely streaked throughout its whole body. Um, subtle grays and uh, tans on the face, really stunning sparrow in the white and the right light. Swamp Sparrow, not a lot of streaking on the breast, very plain, very reddish wings and a very gray face. That'll, that'll really help you if you focus on that gray face, plain belly, red wings, um, in Sparrow. Um, winter wren will be migrating through kind of into the late fall. Small, really uh, dark brown, almost reddish uh, with fine white spotting. Um, house wren, a um, little bit larger, a um, bit more uh, kind of white in the throat, um, longer build, uh, longer tailed even. They'll be around um, they should be around the uh, the bog as well. Similarly, um, ruby crown kinglets, very active birds of the mid mid story. Uh, passage migrants, they're not going to be breeding at the bog, but they're going to be coming through. Um, very active bird, uh, constant movement, flitting the wings, similar to the red breast and nuthatch, which flips its wings. Um, but the ruby crown has the white um, wing bar and has some white around the eyes, um, forward and back from the eye, which make the eye look big. Um, very um, thin, kind of stubby bill on the on the kinglet. Um, and uh, red breast and nuthatch, kind of similar shape to the to the kinglet, um, but the nuthatch is going to be walking up and down tree trunks, similar to its um, southern larger cousin, the white breast and nuthatch, which we should also have the bog at the bog. And then finally, blue gray gnatcatcher, which breeds at the bog, um, but will be moving through and probably heading out in the next couple of weeks as well. Very active bird, hard to keep your eyes on. Um, and blue gray, as the name suggests, um, with the black and outer white tail feathers on this bird. So um, that's that's the the roundup of our of our birds. I know that was quite a lot of information, and um, here are some resources I put together to help you identify your birds through um, through different resources, through different books and online um, applications. So um, with that, I'd love to turn it over to Nora and some questions. Hopefully we've got some folks uh, excited for our walk a uh, week from Saturday. All right, wonderful. Thank you, Will, so much. Um, as far, I think everyone was so engrossed that and trying to take in as much information as possible that um, we didn't have any, we haven't had any questions come in. Um, Folks, you're still welcome to, to type them in now or unmute yourself. Um, we did, Tom had a comment, Tom Albert had a comment um, as you were going through the vireos that there was um, a blue-headed vireo sitting on a nest in Jackson this spring. So oh, cool. something fun to catch. Oh, and then um, actually another question, a question from Tom, how solitary are solitary sandpipers? Are they always? <laughs> um, that's a great question. They they are often alone. That That is actually a good field mark. They are often alone. They really only get together in spring um, on breeding grounds. I, I just have a, a comment, Will, in that I have a very large raspberry patch at my house, as Nora will testify to. And uh, I had a gray catbird 
all summer long. Every time I went out to pick berries, he would just be there, Rawr! like yelling at me. You know, it was pretty funny. It was just he was totally squawking at me every time I was out there picking. That's so. cool. Did he? Did he or she eat the berries? Oh, totally. Yeah, I mean, it was definitely that. defending the berries. <laughs> and in the same patch there, I had a family of grouse that, and they were, it was in the raspberries and my garden in general that just were poking around that area. It was just, <clears throat> it was kind of fun every time I went out to the garden. Cool. I'm jealous. Yeah. So, Will, saw, what is your what is your best recent sighting? Oh, I haven't been doing a lot of birding this fall. Um, I, uh, I, what's oh, best recent sighting outside of my work two days ago. We had a peregrine falcon hanging out for a couple hours on a fire escape, and uh, we got some photos of it and it was hunting pigeons. I work in Westbrook down in the, down in a mill, big old mill along the um, uh, Prezumskit River. And uh, and he was just hunting, he was happy. Um, so that was a really cool sighting. Um, and before that, uh, a couple weeks back, I, I was with a group down at um, Pine Point in Scarborough and we had a wimbrel, which was out in the mudflats feeding big shorebird with long decurved bill like an ibis um probing around the mudflats and down there there was a peregrine falcon two peregrine falcons patrolling pine point and i've never seen this behavior before all the shorebirds were like freaking out and the wimbrel because it's so big it didn't want to fly because it knew it get caught it was dropping into the mudflat and going completely horizontal it laid down with its head out straight and just pressed itself into the mud and oh. was lying motionless while the peregrines were up in the sky flying around looking for shorebirds. Well, so nice. that was cool to see that behavior. Oh, and then finally, the other cool behavior thing I saw this weekend was a male spruce grouse displaying oh. to three females up north, up in uh, uh, Moosehead Lake. I had never seen um, that behavior. I've seen spruce grouse before, you know, on trips or whatever on the road, but never displaying. That was super cool. Looked a lot like a, a rough grouse displaying, but the spruce grouse is that like beautiful blue and black with the red um, above the eyes and its tail um, has this little, you know, kind of brownish orange dots at the end um, and uh, its breast is black and flecked with little white like stars it's just incredible plumage um so that was exciting so i guess i have been birding accidentally lately <laughs> so why are they why are they doing that now that's a good question um someone else had asked me that i wonder if it was just like there's <laughs> There's three Young and confused. There's three <laughs> ladies around and you know, I have no idea. Yeah, yeah. that's a good question. Mm. Um, actually, well, there's an old there's a Cornell bird cast like a uh, live video of a ruffed grouse in like the middle of winter that um, was displaying right on the side of one of those camera like feeding cameras like bird feeder cams. He was displaying at a female who was just sitting in the um, tray of bird seed eating and the male's like right <laughs> on the corner of the image like flapping his tail out and doing all this crazy stuff mm. and she's just eating away she didn't care mm. so i don't know they must just do it from time to time i think i see turkeys display sure in off season too mm. so i saw some bluebirds today when we were leaving the adc today nora oh yeah yeah just in the trees around there so that was fun yeah, that's another good um, example of a breeding migrant, probably more likely now resident um, that we'll see at the bog too. So that'll be a good bird. Yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of bluebirds at my dad's house still hanging out on the nest boxes actually. Yeah, right? yeah, okay. Cool. Yeah, great. All right. Thanks, All right. Wonderful, Thank yeah. You. Any other Any other questions for Will? Well, we've got him here. 
<laughs> Otherwise, um, if you're interested, we still have a number of spaces um, available for next Saturday's walk at the BOG, um, and you can find information and register for that right on um, our website, or if you get our emails, there's a link to, to that as well. But um, should be a good time. That's next Saturday, not two days from now. Uh, that's on the 18th. Cool. See you there. See you there, everyone. Yep. Bye, guys.